Welcome to our 13th podcast. Let's get back in touch with uh, Tristan Gouli. He will explain to us what are the main principles of natural navigation. Savant, nous allons finir par mourir de soif sur ce fichu rafio. Si ça continue, capitaine, nous serons bientôt au régime du docteur Bombard. <rire> <Ouais. rire> Wilson! <laughs> so back to natural navigation. What are the main principles? Well, I think um, we we touched on these these earlier, but I think it starts with uh, understanding the the basic building blocks of navigation, which are direction, speed, distance, and time. Uh, and and uh, speed, distance, and time are are related, as as we all learn at school. You know this. Um, we call it the speed, distance, time triangle. You know, if you know you've been traveling um, 10 kilometers an hour for one hour, you know your distance. You know you've gone 10 kilometers. So if you know two of those three, you've got the other one. But it, for most people, it starts with direction because that's where the fun is. That's where the oh wow moments come from. So. You know, you can learn in my in my last book. There's you know approximately 800 and something ways of of, uh, uh, of sort of getting a handle on direction and that sort of thing, and that's that's the start. So, in the simplest possible terms, you you know if you know you've travelled north for um, uh, 10 minutes and you're you're you know going at a, to keep it simple, let's say six kilometres an hour, then you know you must be one kilometre north of where you started, and that's a very sort of Uh, it, it sounds so obvious that perhaps it doesn't have any value, but but if people do a few of those stages together and then suddenly realise that they're not lost just by finding their direction using nature, then it, there's a there's um, what we call a penny drop moment where you go, wow, this isn't just you know theory about my ancestors. This stuff works, uh, and and as we touched on before, it then it can then move into the more you know the the art of natural navigation. So instead of just thinking. Well, all I'm doing is trying to get, you know, direction and distance and that sort of stuff. And go like, okay, I'm going to treat every single thing I see outside, every plant, every animal, every cloud, every star, as some clue to my journey. It's going to help me with direction, and it's going to make a map for me. Uh, that's the that's the ultimate that's the ultimate goal. Um, uh, and it's such a broad subject that, that there's no right path to that to that sort of place uh, or wrong one it, it you know for different people there'll be some people are fascinated by the stars and will want to do you know make 90 of their natural navigation about about the night sky for other people it's about butterflies and 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 insects so um i'm i'm not prescriptive i never say this is this is the route i sort of say this is the field that we can explore I think you know to get to the the most exciting place, we, we have to see everything as a as a map and part of our journey. Everything is a map and compass, but but to get there, there are there are you know as as many routes as as we want to find. Yeah, and and there's also uh, something that I really appreciate in your last book. Uh, natural navigation is not just about finding north or south. It's well, it's being part of nature. It's being connected to nature. Absolutely, and I um, natural navigation, like all fundamental skills, overlaps with a, a lot of other things. So, um, you know, there's there's not a fine line where natural navigation and natural weather forecasting, you know, where one finishes and the next begins. So, for example, if you are if you are using the wind to navigate, let's say you know it's blowing west, um, uh, and you stay finely tuned to that. And because you're finely tuned to it and you're, you're using both the way the wind is blowing and the way it is shaped, perhaps the grass by your feet, it makes you that much more tuned to the nature, which means you then notice that the, the wind has shift, shifted, you know, maybe 40 or 50 degrees anticlockwise. And then you then think, ah, well, my, my experience outdoors tells me that that means the weather's about to change. So there's no, you know, you're, 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 you're doing natural navigation, but it's you're, you're tuning into the weather change. And then when it, when it rains, you know, three or four hours later, it doesn't surprise you. And, and 
it's this rich tapestry, this idea that, you know, the way a cloud's moving can help you move from A to B and it can tell you what you would experience outdoors in, in the future. They're, they're all they're all different, different faces of the same same beast, if you like. There's also something that I, I was uh, I was really impressed in your book. Well, uh, that part when you explain how to well how, how to read the, the time the time of the night from the stars. It was really really impressive. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I I I still enjoy doing that after many many years of it. And it, it, to me, it's a very nice example of the difference between. Um, necessity and satisfaction because uh quite often when i give talks i say to people you know i might show them a, a slide of um uh the, the casserole you know and, and the north star and say you know we can we can tell the time using this and you sometimes i sense it in the audience they're sort of going that's pretty cool but is it necessary and so i i head that off by saying do we need to do that No, but is it is it tremendous fun? Yes, uh, and and it really is, uh, and it's also a nice example of the the artistry because I noticed it's about this time of year when we all start to notice the stars again because the days aren't too long, and um, like everybody else, I can go a few months around June and not not do a huge amount of stargazing, uh, and I get I get rusty, I get you know less practice at telling the time using the stars, and I notice when I do it again for the first time at this time of year that. You know, I might be 20 minutes out or something or not not quite so much these days, but but in the early days. And then by March, when I've had six months of um, enjoying the stars, you know, I, I tend to be within about 10 minutes because it's, uh, you know, it's practice. And, and that's that's the music analogy again, isn't it? It's, it's very, very simple to do something basically, but actually take, takes time to do it well. Hmm. Last year, I was teaching a, a bushcraft course during a weekend and we had a a superb night sky with all the stars visible it was it was really wonderful and uh, then i i uh, i teached the this way of telling time from the stars and people were amazed that in the night without seeing uh, the sun without even looking at a at a watch you can tell approximately only by looking at natural elements natural signs That's really well. I don't know if, if in English you say elegant. Yes, 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 yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know the young here. I don't know if they still do because I'm, I'm not young enough these days. But uh, you know, might have said kind of like it, it's a neat trick. You know, neat, a neat and elegant are quite sort of related words, aren't they? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And it's um, there's the possibility to be m more philosophical here because if. You know, if we think about um, people's reaction to that, initially, if you show somebody how to find north or how to tell the time using using the saucepan and the and the north star, then um, that people's reaction that sometimes they're closed to it. You know, some people are of, of an urban mindset and they're like, I, I don't see the value of that. But but quite a few people react positively, and when we look at that positive reaction, it gets really interesting because initially, and I can still still remember my reaction to this many many years ago. I think the reaction is. Wow, that that's kind of a neat trick. It, it, it's it, and that's it. It's just a trick that sits in a box. And when I want to use it, I open the box and I use the trick. And for me, the really interesting relationship with with nature comes when we stop thinking of it as a trick that we pull out and use. You know, and I totally see why you're teaching it that way because that's how you get people interested in the first place. But but as people you know develop their interest, there comes a point where you think this isn't a trick that happens to work. This is the way things are. So it's a really, really fundamental concept. And like, like a lot of really fundamental concepts, it's not easy to, to, to articulate. But the point is, and I, I, I put it in, uh, in one of my books, in The Natural Navigator, I, I sort of say, you know, when you teach people that the sun is due south when it's highest in the sky, and, and that's when shadows are shortest. So the shortest shadow of a stick is a perfect north-south line. You know, is that feeling, oh, that's quite a neat trick. But if you then get to the point where you realize it's not a trick because it's that's what south actually means uh east west north south are not you know labels on a compass they are descriptions of our environment as we experience them so sun highest in the sky and the word south effectively mean the same thing so we talked about the sun the stars 
but you also use plants, we already discussed it, and animals in natural navigation. How can they help? Well, uh, animals, it's the same principle as plants, uh, but uh, they don't stay they don't stay in the same place. So there's, there's more challenge there. But the, the principle is that every single animal, including us, depends on plants for, to survive. And every single plant has its, has its habitat, has its ecological niche. So depending how far the animal roams, you have a range from its, from its plant. So an example I give sometimes because it is, it is beautiful and, and people understand it is People understand the stinging nettle example I mentioned earlier. Stinging nettles mean phosphates, which mean you know human beings not far away. Um, and and you know, once we know that there are certain butterflies, like the peacock butterfly, um, that depend on that particular plant uh, for their for large parts of their life cycle, it starts a thought process where we see the butterfly, and and, and a lot of naturalists think think nature is about identifying things it, it comes from the you know the 18th century obsession i think of you know being the first to name something but um you know what i encourage people is to think is is you know names are only helpful if they help you otherwise don't worry about them um but if we if we see a butterfly um and we we know the plant that it has a strong relationship with and we know what that plant is telling us then it is a simple stepping stone approach whereby the sight of the sight of the butterfly tells me that the, the the town or village is not not that far away because it, it it relies on the plant which itself is near near civilization. But there are lots of lots of other examples. I mean, it, again, it's the principle more than the detail. So people, when they're learning this for the first time, they they want lots and lots of tricks, and you know that's why I try and put lots in my book in my books, you know, because it gets people excited. But it, it is the principle that's more important. If we take the view that once we know an animal its habits, it, it, its patterns, it, 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 its habitat, then it is trying to tell us something. So, um, you know, we find, uh, let's think of a good example, um, something like the, the, the jackdaw, part of the, the corvid family. Uh, yeah. it, it doesn't thrive in the centre of towns, but it doesn't like really open countryside either, and it doesn't like dense woodland. What it really loves is, is a mixture it likes, you know, one or two trees, one or two buildings, um, you know, all these things together. So it, it's what we might think of as a sort of suburban type bird. So, you know, just by noticing that the corvids have changed, you know, is, is giving you, you know, it's not a precise map. It's not the sort of map that you're going to be able to use to walk for, for 20 kilometers perfectly. But that's not important. It is still part of that jigsaw. It is still part of that map that this one bird is saying to you, OK, so if you come from the wild, things are becoming less wild. And if you come from a town, you're, you, you know, you, you, you can feel things opening up and the bird is part of that. Um, but there are, you know, many. I mean, I'm learning new examples in that area, you know, pretty much every day. You, you said in your books that uh, it's not important to know each name for each plant. But sometimes Latin names can be uh, can be useful. But besides besides the name, besides the knowledge of the plants of the animals, what is the first thing you teach to a person who attend your courses? Well, we did mention the, the top down. So so I, I do talk about the sun at the beginning. Um, uh, using the sun uh, in the middle of the day is, is is a great sort of great sort of way to start because people tend to remember it and they can use it um, at, at least once a week, if not every day. Um, and then, and then it, it, it steps through, and, and ecology comes at the end. But I, I'd say what I try and leave everybody with is, is an idea that they can, exactly as you say, not obsess about plants. Do not believe that an interest in nature means you have to, you know, particularly children who are maybe being taught, you know, vocabulary. They're having to learn maybe, you know, a hundred words in this language or that language every week. You know, if, if they start to think nature is about memorizing names, it, it all goes wrong. So. So what I quite often do is, is I teach um, the principle, and if I'm doing an outdoor course, uh, something I love to do is, is not mention names at all. I walk from uh, by a river um, up into a hill and then down to a river again, and I ju just ask people to get to know the plants in each terrain. So we start by the river, and they notice all the flowers um, you know, growing by the, by the river, and we don't talk names at all. And I ask them to look at the trees, then we go up onto the hill, and there are, there are totally different trees and flowers. Uh, and then we come down, and I say to people, um, I want you to tell me when you can tell we're, we're getting near the river. 
uh, and they can always do it through the plants. And that, that, is, that is great because what we've done is made a map using the plants without using a single name of a plant. People just suddenly go, wow, I can genuinely tell the river's there. I can't see any water, but I can tell the trees have changed. Suddenly we've got willows again. And, you know, even if they don't know the name willow, they can say, you know, they're saying to themselves, I, I recognize the shape of that tree and I know what it means. And that, that's, you know, that's um, not, not always the first thing I show them, but that's part of the principle that uh, it's not... Uh, it's not about learning just tricks. It's not about just learning names. It's about observing and then and then noticing what those observations mean, the, the patterns that lie behind them. Hmm. And that reminds me of a, of a Sherlock Holmes uh, dialogue. In uh, I don't know in English the, the real t title of the book, but um, there's, a, there's a, a dialogue between Watson and Sherlock when they discuss about the numbers of steps Uh, before their apartment and uh, Sherlock asks how many steps are there and Watson says I don't know I never counted and Sherlock says well you see but you don't observe and I feel that bushcraft or natural navigation is really about observing but people when they are not into bushcraft or navigation they don't observe they, they just see uh, green trees beautiful flowers but they don't notice things Yes, yes, I, I think that's absolutely true. And that, um, I mean, I, I do think the philosophy behind the Sherlock Holmes uh, character is, is uh, you know, I've, I find it very inspiring. And it, it's sometimes in my talks, what I say is that, you know, we, we've definitely worked out that the, the human animal enjoys puzzles uh, and deduction and, and solving puzzles. And what we tend to do is spend a lot of our free time um, assuming that that's an indoors activity you know so we we might watch a, a tv program or, or or a film about a detective solving a murder um or we do a crossword or or sudoku or some one of these type puzzles that that is deduction but um the there's this assumption and has been for at least 100 years i think that as soon as we step outside that part of our brain wants to go to sleep uh and uh, i think there's a a, a small but you know, growing minority of people who go, well, wait a minute, I really love using that part of my brain and I love being outdoors. And it's quite nice to know that that part of the brain, you know, can have some fun outdoors. So that brings me to the next, to the next question. What do you like the most about being outdoors in the wilderness? Is it the thrill of, the, of an adventure? Is it to solve mysteries? I think it's... Um... It's strangely one of the harder questions for me to answer that because I do, I get a, a, a thrill. It's almost like a, like a sort of high feeling um, quite often in wilderness. I mean, not always. We all know what it's like to, you know, that feeling. It's three o'clock in the morning. It's, it's going to be a few hours till, you know, you're warm again. You're shivering there. You can't sleep. You're, you know, you haven't eaten properly. You know, all that sort of stuff is, is not endless joy. But by and large, um, I don't know why. I think it's so fundamental that I can't analyze it. I get a, uh, a you know, um, a good feeling in, in wild places. And I think, for me, the, there's a, a sort of happy place that we can all get to when we, we feel that a place isn't 100% alien. So if you take somebody who's lived in the center of a city all their life, you know, perhaps they're, let's say they're 18 and they've never really been outside the center of a city. If you, if you take them out into a wild area, they're probably not going to enjoy it the first time because it is just too alien. It is, it feels threatening. Um, but if you, you know, if you take somebody who's lived in a wild area, the same wild area all their lives, they're probably not going to get a sense of real excitement when they step out their door and into this wilderness because they're, they're familiar with it. I think the really exciting things come when we, we learn just enough about the wilderness that it, it, it feels uh, comfortable, but there's a sense of discovery because we don't, you know, we don't, we know we don't know everything that's going on around us. Um, and, and so we can, we can have the best of both worlds. It's not alien and terrifying, but it's certainly not boring because there's a sense of discovery every minute. And that's, that's very much how I experience it. Uh, I try to walk outdoors, even if it's only for 10 minutes. I, you know, I try and have some quality outdoor time every day. And I, and I try and notice something that I haven't before, but, but it will, it will be in the context of the, 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 you know, the things I do know. So just, just, you know, this morning I was, 
I was noticing how wild basil was still in, in flower and I hadn't noticed that for, for, for a month or so, even though I've probably walked past it many, many times because it's, it's near my home. Uh, and that's sort of making me think something about the seasons. You know, I'm, I'm always thinking, is there a navigation thing there? Well, it's in a south facing spot, but you know, um, so yeah, no, I, I'm, as you can probably tell, I'm finding it a hard, hard question to answer, but in a nice way. So you teach natural navigation to a lot of people throughout the UK. You even teach natural navigation in Hyde Park in, in the center of London, right? Yes, yeah, it's, it, there's lots and lots of clues. I, I could run a course for three days in Hyde Park, no problem. There's lots of stuff there, and I'm sure it'd be the same in the center of Paris. So uh, any chance you'll come to France one day? Oh, I'd love to. I um, I mean, I used to, uh, we, we haven't for a couple of years, but we used to have our uh, summer holidays in uh, in Brittany um, when yeah. the children were very, very young. It was, we, we used to go to a... Uh, a very old little house there and it was nice because there weren't many cars around so they could sort of run around without us having to worry but uh, um, and I, I do I do adore France I haven't done as much uh, wilderness time in France as I'd like so maybe I mean I'd love to get there the challenge is time at the moment I never thought I'd have this problem but it's a nice problem to have but, uh, I'm really nicely busy with the, the books and the talks and things and I, you know it'd be great um, you know at the, at the very least to get to uh, to get to France to do a, you know, a, a mini course or, a, or at the very least a talk. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't, haven't got a date yet, but one day soon, I hope. If you were to be lost in a remote location, I mean, lost in a survival situation, what is the only survival tool you'd want to have? Well, this is a, an interesting question because I could answer it in a truthful way or I could answer it in a sort of make myself look you know, like a proper survivalist, you know, so... <laughs> You know, bushcrafters would probably want me to say I, I'd want my trusty knife with me. But, but in truth, if I was really worried, I'd, I'd be quite keen on. Um, do you know um, emergency um, beacons? These ELTs, we call them an EPERBs, emergency position indicating radio beacon. Yes, um, some kind of uh, satellite <laughs> telephone, right? Yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm genuinely worried that I'm not going to survive, then uh, I'm not I'm not too proud to ask for help. <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's maybe the only way to survive. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just to recall, you are the author of uh, several books. In France, we have the chance to have the Natural Navigator translated as uh, La, La Boussole Naturelle. And your last book is uh, The Walker's Guide to Outdoors Clues and Signs, which is uh, by far my favorite. Uh, can you recall us uh, every title of your books? Uh, I think, think I can. Um, there's The Natural Navigator, uh, La Boussole Naturelle, as you, you mentioned, and The Natural Explorer, then How to Connect with Nature, uh, then The Walker's Guide to Outdoor Clues and Signs, uh, and I have one coming out next year that I'm not allowed to t say the title of yet, but in a week or two you'll, you'll probably see some information on my either my email or my website. Yeah. Uh, I'm following the newsletter, so uh, I had the email a few days ago about it. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, besides your books, uh, do you have any book to recommend about the outdoors or for about navigation? Well, uh, in the in the world of navigation, I was inspired by a, a, a man you've probably heard of called um, uh, Harold Gatti, um, and uh, he's he's written a number of books. He was like me, uh, but, but uh, more experienced in conventional navigation. He was a very accomplished um, pilot of small aircraft and, um, and a sailor too. And he, he, he wrote, um, you know, he, 50 you know, years ago, he was writing, um, a little more than 50 years ago, he was writing about natural navigation. And uh, he, he's, you know, been an inspiration to me. So natural navigation, I'd recommend any of his books at all. Um, uh, because, I, you know, he's, in the philosophical spectrum, he's slightly more towards the practical, um, and I'm slightly more towards the, you know, this is rewarding because it's fun and interesting, whereas he's kind of like, these techniques can get you out of trouble, but they're all, you know, we're, we're coming from the same place. Um, and outside of that, um, uh, I think I've enjoyed the some of the... The, the, the great wilderness writing uh, through, um, I'd, I'd recommend. Uh, but I do find it's very, very um, 
subjective. I've had so many books about the outdoors and, and, you know, on a wilderness theme and things like that recommended to me. And, you know, sometimes they're fantastic and sometimes they're terrible. So um, I'm slightly hesitant to recommend things sometimes because I think people will be put off all the other stuff I do if they don't like a particular book. So I do think, like all reading, it's it's good to good to good to try a few things and if after a chapter you hate something then uh, there's nothing lost at least you've tried it okay and what will be your first tip for a beginner who wants to try natural navigation for the very first time to discover it i do i have two tips here um uh, the first one is to step outside and ask yourself which way are you looking um, when, when you don't know the answer straight away and see if you can answer it and, and just appreciate it. it doesn't matter if you're wrong. But just by looking at the if you're in an urban situation, you're looking at the roofs and the satellite and all sorts of things. Uh, if you're in a rural situation, you might be looking at the trees and you just try and answer the question and you just say to yourself, it doesn't matter if I'm wrong. It doesn't matter if I'm 180 degrees wrong. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask that question. And that's the beginning of the journey. Um, uh, And um, I think the next the next thing to do is um, the next time you're on a journey and somebody else is the navigator, maybe you're walking somewhere on a weekend, um, uh, somewhere you haven't uh, walked, you haven't done before, uh, and you get to the end of the journey and you you just get out a piece of paper with the person who is the navigator and you try and sketch on a piece of paper what you think you just did. So you say to yourself, okay, well, I... I sort of know that we walked, you know, south out of that village for about 10 minutes, but then we turned west. So you draw all that on a piece of paper. And again, uh, you can be fairly sure you're going to get some things wrong, but you can be just as sure you're going to get some things right. And then you have a look with the navigator. They open the map and you say, well, you're absolutely right to here. But there where you thought that tree had been blown over from the southwest, you hadn't noticed that there was a building sheltering it. And at that point, that your own detective work, your own story has begun because you're starting to see the things you've done right. The areas that um, you know uh, are you know trickier, but you know you've you've, you've had a really good taste uh, without without any sort of danger or, or or setting out on any great expeditions. You've had a real taste of, of trying to trying to understand a journey in terms of natural navigation. So uh, thank you, Tristan. Can you just record us where we can find your work uh, on the internet i think you have a facebook page a blog and you are a pretty active twitter user too yeah yeah thanks um uh, the best the best place is, is my website which is um www.naturalnavigator.com um and uh from that you can find my twitter which is uh natural nav n-a-t-u-r-a-l-n-a-v um My Facebook, uh, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time on that. Honestly, I, I am on, I am on Twitter, and I try and respond as best as I can to people. Uh, but Facebook, it just takes the blogs from the website, so uh, you can find me on Facebook. But um, the the best places, in honesty, at the moment are um, naturalnavigator.com and naturalnav on Twitter. I just started uh, the Natural Navigator on on Instagram, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Because I, I know a lot of young people prefer Instagram these days, um, and I'm, I'm very keen that you know it's not just um, you know the older technologies where you find find natural navigation. Well, thank you very much, Tristan. Cheers, Alan. I really hope to attend one of your talks. Wilson, je suis désolé. A huge thank you to Tristan Gouli, the natural navigator. You can find him on his website, naturalnavigator.com. Soon I will have the pleasure to release another podcast with uh, foreign guests. I will be interviewing Paul Kirtley, but it will take me some time to translate all the interview. To stay in touch, uh, feel free to like my Facebook page, Nature Aventure Survie, or follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Have a good day, have a good bushcraft! <laughs> <laughs>